Okay, so this week we have the Haftorah of Yirmiyahu about the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. It's the first of three Haftorahs about the destruction of Beis HaMikdash. And there is a connection between the Haftorah, not only with the time that we're in, but also with Parshas Pinchas. What's the connection? So we find an open connection between Yirmiya and Pinchas. It says that both Pinchas and Yirmiya come from non-Jewish families. Pinchas comes from Yisrael, and Yirmiya comes from Rachav. And because of their origins, Jewish people mocked them. And therefore God tested that Pinchas is not only the son of, grandson of Yisrael, but that Pinchas is a grandson of Aaron So to about Yermia, in addition to him being a grandson of, of Rachav, the Torah emphasizes about Yermia, this Torah, Yermia, the son of Chilkiyahu, and comes from the Koyan. So that's the simple connection between Yermia and Pinchas, but it's understood that the connection between Yermia and Pinchas is not just that both of them were scorned and both of them needed God to protect them and prove that their lineage is from, uh, uh, from Koyanim, but there's also a, a inner connection is it in, the, in the content and the meaning of what Yermia and Pinchas uh, are about. And this connection between them is expressed in this detail. Uh, and that's why uh, this detail is what is written about in the uh, in the oral Torah. In other words, there's something. There's a deeper connection between them, and this connection finds expression in the fact that the Torah had to um, classify their lineage as being uh, as a pedigree, if you will, is, is prestigious. So, what's the connection between Yirmiya and Pinchas? We also need to understand the connection between the intro of the Haftorah this week to the content of the Haftorah. In the first section of the Haftorah, the Torah talks about how Yermia became a prophet. God spoke to me, says Yermia, and said, before you were formed in the womb, I knew you, I have made you to be a prophet to the nations. And Yermia said, I don't know about this, I'm a child. And God responds, don't say you're a child. I have, com I have uh, commanded you and empowered you. And then the Torah begins describing the prophecy of Yirmiya about all of the negative things that will happen and the um, parable of the, of the almond stick, that this will happen quickly as the growth of an almond. So the question is, what's the connection between the intro that God gave to Yirmiya uh, about him feeling unworthy to be a prophet of Hashem and God saying that he is empowered? What does that have to do with the... Uh, content of the Haftorah, the destruction, the impending uh, destruction of the Beis HaMikdash. So let's first analyze the connection between Yirmiya and Pinchas, and we'll get back to that. In the time of both Yirmiya and Pinchas, the Jewish people were in a very low state spiritually. By the story of Pinchas, the Jewish people were sinning with the daughters of Moab, and they were worshipping the Poor. And in the time of Yirmiya, the Jewish people were worshipping the idols of Baal, as it says at length in the prophecy of Yirmiya, the, the uh, low state the Jewish people were at then. And each of them, both Yirmiya and Pinchas, inspired the Jewish people to do teshuva. Yirmiya inspired them to do teshuva through words of rebuke. And Pinchas inspired the Jewish people to do teshuva by publicly killing Zimri in, in a way that everyone could see why he was killed. And that inspired the Jewish people to teshuva. That's what the Torah emphasizes when Yirmiya kills Zimri. It says, the Kano He was zealous for my glory in their midst. What is the meaning of the words in their midst? What is that highlighting? The Torah is emphasizing that Pinchas' action aroused a feeling of teshuva amidst the Jewish people. He, he actually changed something inside them. And that's why it caused atonement. That's why after Pinchas did this, the plague stopped. But 
this is not sufficient to explain the connection between Pinchas and Yirmiya. The fact that they were in a low situation, the fact that they, they were inspired to do tshuva. We find many, many other Jewish leaders being in a time of hardship spiritually and inspiring Jewish people to do tshuva. The connection, the common denominator between Yirmi and Pinchas is not only that they inspired the Jewish people to return to Hashem, but it's also in the method and the means how they inspired the Jewish people. The Torah says about another prophet, about Yeshaya, um, that he was very different to Yirmiya. Yirmiya speaks only about the destruction, and Yeshaya speaks only about the comfort, about the coming of Mashiach. Yirmiya's Nevua, his prophecy is all about how the base of Israel will be destroyed, and Yeshaya is only about the comfort that will happen as a result of the destruction. And that's why the name Yeshaya means salvation. And the name Yermia, Yermia has in it the letters Memresh, which mean bitter. Or in the language of the Talmud, why is his name Yermia? Because Yermia is related to the word Irmia, which means destruction. So the difference between their prophecies, what they emphasized, is connected to the time that they lived. In the language of the previous Rebbe, Yermia was living in a time of the Chia Vahestr, a time the Jewish people were estranged the time when they were of concealment. And Yeshai was living in a time of revelation. So therefore the prophecy of Yirmiya was in a manner of being in a state of concealment, destruction, while the prophecy of Yeshaya was, was expressing revelation, expressing Gaul, express, expressing comfort. So although the prophecy of Yeshaya also has a lot of words of rebuke for the Jewish people's sins at the time, as we find in many chapters in Yirmiya, until the chapter that we're going to read on the week before Tisha B'av. Uh, yet, despite that, the entire book of Yeshaya is called a book of comfort because his rebuke um, led to the discussion of Teshuva and comfort. It's about revelation. His prophecies about the Geula, that, that will happen as a result of Chu. That's, that's his focus. Yermia was inspiring the Jewish people at a time of concealment, time of confusion. And he was telling them the opposite. He was telling them that if you don't do Chuva, uh, the base of will be destroyed. And that's a connection between Yermia and Pinchas, because Pinchas, like Yermia, caused a atonement for the Jewish people not through revealing godliness, not through talking about the comfort that will happen as a result of the, the Jewish people doing teshuva, but rather Pinchas was, a, was connecting the Jewish people to Hashem in a time of absolute concealment, as we'll discuss in a moment. But before we do, let's first um, look at the words that God said about Pinchas. Pinchas, says God, brought back my anger from the Jewish people because he was zealous my honor, and I did not destroy the Jewish people. Uh, and therefore, God says, because he was else my honor, I will give him my covenant of peace, and he and his children will be claimed. In the language of the Torah, it seems that the, re the main reason why Pinchas gets this blessing of the eternal covenant of peace is because he took away God's anger from the Jewish people. So, The fact that the way he did this was by being zealous for God's honor, um, that was just a means how he brought this about. But that's not really the, 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 the reason why Pinchas gets this distinction. Not, it's not because of his zealousness. It's because he, he achieved that God's wrath should subside. So the question is, we find by Moshe Rabbeinu many times that he succeeded in taking away God's anger. As the Torah says in the Chumash, many places. So, what's unique about Pinchas that it's specifically because he, um, uh, by the way, the background uh, music of the uh, of uh, the Shluchim office uh, is is free. Um, how do you say "excuse me" in in um, French? Excuse me, guys. Pardon moi. <laughs> All right. Okay. Anyway, so uh, so. So what was unique about Pinchas? Well, how did he achieve this, um, this, this, uh, 
what did he do more than Moshe Rabbeinu in drawing away God's wrath? And that's why he earned this distinction of being a kain. The truth is that um, not only do we not find that Moshe Rabbeinu being given the gift of being a kain for himself and his children, uh, but the opposite, we find that Hashem uh, refused to give him that kind of reward. As the Talmud says uh, later on in the Torah portion, that Moshe Rabbeinu asked God that he, his son should take over his position after he passes away. And God didn't agree. And so Moshe Rabbeinu's greatness was not given to his children. And yet Pinchas got this distinction. And it seems that Moshe and Pinchas did pretty much the same thing. They both achieved that God's wrath should, should subside. So let's analyze the difference between Moshe and Pinchas. How did Moshe achieve that God's wrath should be taken away from the Jewish people? How do you, so to speak, calm the situation? Moshe Rabbeinu achieved this through his prayers. He prayed to God and he achieved that he interceded on our behalf and he caused God to be appeased. But Pinchas didn't do this through his prayers. It says that Pinchas did this through his, his efforts, what he did, Bekanias Kenasi. So he accomplished by him acting zealous for God's honor that the Jewish people did Teshuva. It wasn't that God uh, took away his wrath. It was more importantly that he got us to sit up and pay attention and do truth. That's one difference. The other was it my... was it actually the act of him doing it, or was it the fact that a miraculous voice came out of heaven afterwards when they wanted to kill him that said, "No, he's actually correct." We're all like, "Whoa, okay, I guess he's right." Well, let's say this: the uh, the voice from heaven ratified what he had done, but it, it was the action that he did that that really um, was the message. Just they didn't know what that action meant. The first yeah, we could act, we could murder. we could we could theorize and then say if that voice didn't come out, then a we possibly could have killed him, and it would have been a completely different story, and we wouldn't have had that teshuva feeling. So I think I think that's a huge aspect of it. Yes, obviously it was, you know, our effort down here per se that had the reciprocation from above. So yes, it all started with the act down here, but it what finalized it and solidified it was this miraculous voice. Okay, let's let's say that. But ultimately, the, the, what the change that we're saying is about Pinchas is that he caused a change within us. You, you're saying the fireworks were more about than, than his action. All right. The, the, the fireworks and his action synergistically affected us to do tshuva. Unlike Moshe Rabbeinu, his achievement was in God. He caused God to forgive us. He caused God's anger to subside. That's the first difference. The other difference is, is that Moshe Rabbeinu um, stood for the Jewish people and he told God, erase me from your book if you don't forgive me. Moshe Rabbeinu asked God to take him out of the Torah. What is that? What is that, that kind of request? Where does that come from? What is Moshe asking? He's saying, I want to lose something spiritually. I want to be disconnected from your Torah unless you forget the Jewish people. He's giving up his soul. That's what Moshe is doing. What is Pinchas doing? Pinchas is putting his life in danger. As the Talmud says, as you just mentioned, Abzev, that the tribe of Shimon wanted to kill him and he was saved in a miraculous way. So Moshe Rabbeinu did, gave up his spiritual connection to God, whereas Pinchas put his life on the line. So doesn't mean that Moshe wasn't ready, God forbid, to do the same thing. If he needed to give his life, he'll give his life. Um, but that does tell us that this wasn't what Moshe Rabbeinu's service of Hashem was. That wasn't what his, what his thrust of Hashem wanted from him was. But still, there was a difference what they did. So what's the difference in Moshe and Pinchas? Moshe Rabbeinu is about revealing godliness from above to below. Moshe Rabbeinu is about revelation. About light shining in the world. And Pinchas, the service of Hashem, is from below to above, about elevating the world and bringing the world to a higher place. That's why it says that Moshe's main role is receiving the Torah. Moshe got the Torah from Mount Sinai and he gave it over to the next generation, to his students. He taught them Torah. Um, and Moshe Rabbeinu gave the Torah over. He passed the torch to the next generation. He is a channel of God's revelation. Um, 
So how did Moshe Rabbeinu get rid of negativity? Uh, through light, through light pushing away darkness. The light of the Gali light of Torah pushes away the darkness automatically. That's Moshe Rabbeinu's way of serving Hashem. Pinchas had here change, affect change, through inspiring us the tshuva, which means to break the darkness itself and lift us up and bring us back to Hashem. The same is also about Moshe Rabbeinu and Pinchas, their own persona, not just what they did, but this is also the difference between who they were. Moshe Rabbeinu's service of Hashem is mainly with his soul. Elsewhere, Chassidah says that Moshe Rabbeinu's mother was pregnant with him for only seven months because his main role in this world was not to elevate the, to his body, but just his soul should come in the world to, to reveal godliness. It wasn't a gestation period of, of, of pregnancy, the lengthier time of Elijah versus Moshe Rabbeinu indicates that Elijah was there for 12 months in the womb, indicates that Elijah was more about the physical being in the body, whereas Moshe Rabbeinu just passed through his, swiftly, which indicates He's about revealing the light of Hashem, the light of his soul shine. Uh, Pinchas, however, he served Hashem, so to speak, with his body. When your service of Hashem is because of revelation, so where does that touch? Revelation touches the soul, which this, the soul is a vessel for revelation. It doesn't touch the body. And even though it, re, it, it, it affects the body, but it's not that the body itself um, becomes naturally, organically a vessel for the light of the Neshama. Yeah. However, the service of Pinchas, from below to above, from the body, his work was to work through the darkness and elevate the Jewish people and bring them to Teshuvah to elevate the world from within. And that's a connection between Pinchas and Eliyahu and Abi. As our sages say, I just mentioned, yeah, I didn't know there was much in this talk, that uh, Eliyahu's service Hashem was from below to above. And that's why um, the word Eliyahu is numerically equivalent to 52, because in Kabbalah, 52 is associated with elevating the body of uh, Shem Ban. And that's also why Eliyahu's mother was, as mentioned, was pregnant with him for 12 months, because his, his service was about the body. That's why Eliyahu Nabi. He says elsewhere, when he passed away, his body went to heaven. Mm -hmm. So this, th th this explanation um, tells us why there's a difference between Moshe Rabbeinu and Pinchas. Moshe Rabbeinu, through his prayers, achieved God to be appeased and God to take away the decree from the Jewish people from above to below. God changed the, the, the decree. Pinchas, who inspired us to do Teshuvah, was from below to above. Moshe Rabbeinu's sacrifice was with his soul. Pick me out of your Torah. Pinchas' sacrifice was with his body, putting his life on the line. That's why it says in the Zohar that Pinchas rectified the sin of Nadab and Abiyu. What was their sin? Their sin was they wanted their soul to be close to God and they didn't care if they passed away. It doesn't matter to them. But uh, they didn't want to take their body with them. They just wanted their soul to be burnt up in light of Hashem. And their body to stay here. Pinchas, his service of God, rectified their sin. His, his, his service of Hashem was about lifting up and elevating the physical, elevating the body, breaking through the darkness. So th there's also a practical difference as a result of these distinction between Moshe Rabbeinu and Pinchas. It is an afkamina. There's a, there's a practical difference between them. When your service of God is from a boat above to below, about revealing light, so then the world is indeed illuminated by the light, but since the world itself has not been purified, not been elevated, so the world remains in its original state. It's just that the light of Hashem is reaching here. And that's where you find that even though when God gave us the Torah, it says our impurity left us momentarily. However, then the sin of the golden calf brought the impurity back. The sin of the tree of knowledge brought impurity to the world. It departed temporarily through the giving of the Torah, but then it departed again, returned again, rather, with the sin of the golden calf. However, when the service of God is from below to above, that the world itself is elevated, then it stays. And that's why the, the atonement that Pinchas achieved was not just temporarily, but it's, as the Sifri says, that he, Pinchas atoned the Jewish people until the time of Tchias Hames, until the time of the resurrection of the dead. His actions still stand before God and cause, achieve, cause atonement for us. And that's the reason why he uh, was given this unique distinction that he and his children will be kind of him uh, in a way that never stops 
because his he caused a change from below to above in a way that lasts. So now we can explain the, the connection between Pinchas and Yermia. As we said before, the difference between Yermia and Yeshaya is that Yermia was living in the time of concealment of godliness, and Yeshaya was living at a time of revelation. And the difference between them is above to below or below to above. Yeshaya, whose service of Hashem is connected with the soul, is connected with revelation. Therefore, his service of Hashem is associated with the time of the Beis Amigdash, with the time of revelation, when the, God, when the light of Hashem shines the world openly and clearly. This service of Hashem um, doesn't elevate the physical world. However, the service of God from below to above, in a time of concealment, a time of darkness, which in, a, in, in, in every person's, in, in our personal life, that means elevating the body itself, elevating the world around us, the physical world around us, that's associated more with a time of destruction of Yisam English, a time of concealment, a time when our main focus is not to be affected by the challenges that we are in, not to be affected by the darkness of the exile, and to transform the darkness of the exile itself to light. As the Torah says, of Mashiach will come, the night itself will shine like the day. So this is why Pinchas and Yermia both came from non-Jewish families and why the Jewish people scorned Pinchas and Yermia. And this is expressed in the common denominator of both of their service of Hashem was from below to above, both regarding themselves. They're about elevating their own, their own non-Jewish family, elevating the physical world. And also regarding their not just regarding themselves, elevating where they came from, elevating their, 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 their natural environment, where they came from, the non-Jewish families they were born into, or coming from, from non-Jewish origins, but also the way they impacted the world, that despite the fact that Jewish people scorned them, they inspired the Jewish people themselves to teshuva. They were scorned, they weren't affected by being scorned, and they, and they affected the, those around them to, to return to Hashem. When the light of Hashem is descending from above to below, the light can only reach a place which is a vessel for it. And if the world is in a status, in a state of, of opposition to the light of Hashem, so the light can't reach it. It only could break it. But through elevating the world from below to above, elevating the world itself, not just shine the light of Hashem and then zapping it, but elevating the world itself, and reaching a place which scorns holiness, reaching a place that is, even though the world is in a state of scorning holiness, it's against holiness. However, if the thrust, if the, traject, if the trajectory is elevating the world from below to above, it's also elevate, able to elevate a place of darkness itself and transform the darkness itself to light. So bottom line in our lives, what's the lesson? There are some people which are very soul, into soul stuff, in the Torah, in the davening. They don't, Devote themselves with the, the, the matter, with the world itself, with the things in their, with, with more bodily, earthy things to permeate those things with holiness. And so, too, in a more um, generic um, outlook, there, there are some people that um, may elevate their body as well, the soul and their body, but they don't look outside of their four cubits. They don't look out of where they are. They don't care about what's happening around them. So Rebbe says you have to know that that's not something which can last. When a person's involved with soul-like things, you may be in a higher, you may be in a higher environment right now, but when you have, go back to the, your regular earthy, worldly things, not only are you, are you going to elevate those things, but they're going to bring you down. And so too regarding the general, the the outside world, um, when a person is doing everything in his own four cubits, in his own immediate surroundings, just, just himself. He's, he's staying protected. Um, if he doesn't, if he'll be in a situation that he'll have to do it, he'll have to be in contact with the world. If, he has, if, he, if he's now taken out of that, that safe space, this little oasis he's created for himself, the outside world will bring him down. If he's just on the defense, you know, just protecting himself, but he's thrust into a new kind of environment, he's going to be taken down. So therefore, a Jew has to serve Hashem together with serving Hashem internally with his soul. He has to be devoted to the outside as well. 
and not just to the outside, but in words of the Rebbe, to the outside in a, to a place where there's nothing lower than that. And also that place, which is, there's nothing lower than that place to make that place itself a vessel for the wellsprings of Chassidus and Terimitzis. This is especially relevant at this time of Bainim and Sarim in three weeks. The Abishter sent the Jewish people to exile with the intent that we should elevate the exile itself, to transform the darkness itself to light. The Jew might say, how can I go through such a dark time, such a dark, especially, you're not just asking me, Rebbe says, not to be affected by the world, you're asking me to transform the time of the three weeks itself and to make this a time of joy and happiness. How do you demand this from me to, to do this? So this is the answer of the Torah, of the first of the three weeks. And the Torah prefaces the story of Yermia with telling us the, the um, lineage of Yermia and how Yermia comes from the Kain by telling us this, how Yermia was scared to be a prophet to the nations, and our God told Yermia, don't be afraid, I'm with you. God is with him and gives him all the necessary strength that is able to affect the nations. And this is so true for each of us as well, that despite the fact that there's a great consumer of godliness in the time of the exile, Hashem gives us all the necessary strength we need to, to, to um, transform this concealment to life. And this is it's known that the descent of the soul to this world is literally like exile. And just like this is true for um, the soul, um, so, so too is by each person personally, Rebbe says, in their small world that is man. When a soul descends into the three weeks, the three weeks of destruction are, are parallel to the three lower worlds of Bria, Yitzira, and Asiya. The world of Bria, it says, evil exists. The soul God starts to get scared. How will the soul be able to do its job in the, in the situation of exile, in the situation of concealment? So the soul was told by the beginning of its descent to this world, in the first half Torah of the three weeks, before you were born in the womb, God says, I've known you. Before you have gone out of the womb, I've sanctified you to be a prophet for the nations. You don't have to be afraid about the fact that your mission is to be a prophet to the nations. Your service of Hashem, to elevate the goy which is within you, the, which means the animal soul, the body, the animal soul, and your, and, and your portion of the world. Don't be afraid. Why shouldn't you be afraid? God says, because before you were formed in the womb, I have known you. You have a holy in the soul, Rebbe, heart of God, which is above, is, which, it's, which is above the whole descent in this world. Before you've gone out of the womb, God says, I've sanctified. Not only do you have a holy soul, but God says, I've sanctified you in the womb because every soul studies Torah with God in, in the womb. So even though a person, when he's born, an angel comes and makes you forget the whole Torah, that's only, that's only, in a, that's only the way things are externally. But deep th within us, there is a power that's granted to us by the Malach, by the angel teaching us Torah in the womb, so that wherever we are in this world, we should be able to learn the same Torah that we learned in the womb. So the Shaman says, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just a child. It's true that deep down within me, I know the whole Torah deep within me, but in a, looking at things from a more manifest, more revealed state, I'm just a child. So it may be true that regarding my soul deep down, I have enough inner strength not to be affected from the world and to learn Torah, but to be a prophet to the nations, to affect the world, to transform the body and the animal soul, to change the world, I'm just a child. So God says to the soul, don't say I'm a child because wherever I will send you shall go. Don't be afraid of you, afraid of anything. God says, I am with you. Not only do you have an neshama and not only do you have a power because you were taught the whole Torah in your mother's stomach before you were born, but even after, even after you're born, when the Shama is already in the body and the Shama is in time of exile, God gives him special, special strength. As the Torah says, I am with you. The way, the way you are here in this world, you should be able to accomplish your mission. God says, wherever I will send you to the nations, uh, both, both in turning away from evil 
as God told Yirmiya, to destroy, and also to create goodness, to build. And furthermore, God says, Don't be afraid. God says to the soul, You shouldn't think, this is the last verse concluding right now, you shouldn't think that you will be that you'll be that you'll be should be satisfied in saving yourself. I save my own soul. And and what will happen with the world, you'll say I'm a child, I can't do anything with the world. So Hashem tells the Nishama that since you are in a body and an animal soul in this physical world, so what's happening in the world, it affects you. It has to, you shouldn't say, I can, I'll just take care of me. That Hashem says, because you are put in this world, you can't say that. It's good. Whatever happens around you affects you. Yeah, and if you want to make sure that you shouldn't... Hey, I, uh, Oh, last line. I'm finishing. So, if you want to make sure that you will um, uh, not be, be be affected by the nations, you shouldn't be afraid of them. To make the world a home for Hashem, and through this service of Hashem, we will merit to have the time of Pinchas El Yo will tell us the good news of the coming of Mashiach and reveal us and bring the Gumit Hashem.